Funding for Current Conversations is provided by the University of Oklahoma President's Office, OU Outreach and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today, we are on location at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Fort Worth, Texas. We'll be talking about issues of native sovereignty, education, and social justice. Our special guest is Gwich'in tribal person, Yvonne Peter, who is vice chancellor for rural, community, and native education at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. Stay with us and meet this dynamic visionary leader. Vice Chancellor Yvonne Peter uh, from the University of Alaska. Welcome to Current Conversations. It's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, let's introduce you to our audience. I, I think people aren't going to know what a vice chancellor does. And maybe you could talk about that for a minute and also talk about your tribal affiliation, if you would. Yeah, Shoji Yvonne Peter Oji, Vashrain Kogotsanithli, Gatan Guichi, University of Alaska Fairbanks, Kuchotgoth, and Zagishi Genjutsuithli. I uh, want to introduce myself first to my language, which is the Gwich'in language. It's uh, one of the furthest, probably the furthest north of the Diné languages. Um, we're relative to the Apache and the Navajo people down south. We're all part of a broad language family that has many thousands of years of history in North America, of course. So you're from there and grew up there? Yeah, I'm from there and grew up there and among the Gwich'in mm -hmm. nation. Uh, so, but to answer your question about being a vice chancellor, it's, it's just interesting when I, when I was interviewing for this job with the chancellor, it was one of, I don't know, 13 different hoops I had to jump through, including, in, you know, giving a presentation that was streamed across the state, uh, speaking with the faculty, with students, with advisory councils and uh, core leadership teams, and they were all assessing whether I had what it takes to, to serve in role. And, but then when I got into the private interview, the chancellor, he said, do you know what the word chancellor means? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, actually, no, I don't know what the word <laughs> chancellor means. And he said, don't worry about it. Very, very few people do. And he said, uh, it, 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 it comes from an older word, and I should have remembered whether it was Greek or Latin, but I'm not mm -hmm. strong in any of those areas. But he said, it means a door. And what was interesting about that is that um, maybe about half a year earlier, if that, I was doing work with uh, an Inupiaq community from the Northwest Arctic part of Alaska. And they had gifted me with a, an Inupiaq name. And I'm Gwich'in, so they're a different tribal nation. And there was a group of maybe 20 of them. And they had had, I didn't know this, but they had this conversation over the course of the week. We were doing work on, focused on healing. And, and at the end of it, they gifted me this name. And they said, the name we decided to gift you is Dalu. And you know, to this day, in, in many parts of Alaska, the, the, especially in the back regions, they, they call me Dalu. That's my name. And I'm proud of that name. And uh, they said, it means door. And we, they said, we see you as someone who opens doors, and you show people things, but you always leave it up to them on whether they want to walk through. And so then, with, that is with, very nice. With, yeah, and, and within a year, I had no idea that I would be a vice chancellor at the university, by the way. <laughs> it was never something I really went after initially, it was the people at the university who came to me and said, we really need someone like you at our institution. Now, are there a, is there a real high percentage of indigenous people at the University of Alaska Fairbanks? Yeah, we, we have 20% of our student population is Alaska Native. And, and, and so we have a, a, you know, a pretty dense indigenous population within the institution. Uh, we have a really great suite of indigenous programs that have been developed uh, really since the 80s, strengthened substantially in the 90s, and that continue to grow and develop today. Um, but I, going back to the, 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 the door, though, you know, I'm always one of those people that looks for those signs in life. And so being gifted this name, Dalu, and then later ending up in a position that means essentially a doorkeeper to an institution, yeah. um, made me feel like I was on the right path. Absolutely. So is there a strong tradition at the University of Alaska of having uh, tribally identified people in positions like yours to serve students effectively? Um, 
Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the history in Alaska is very similar to the history in, in the continental United States with colonization, um, assimilation policies. Um, you know, my, my grandparents, for example, weren't even citizens in our own homeland. And I grew up with my grandfather in my village, so this is not a long ago history in, in my experience. And my mother uh, grew up during the boarding school era, was sent off, um, you know, basically being forced to give up who she is, her language, her identity, um, as a part of that uh, forced assimilation process. And so we suffered a lot of the same discrimination, uh, segregation. We had segregated schools. Native people weren't allowed to shop in stores, own businesses. And so naturally, the, the university was not a welcoming place. Wait, say the last part again. Uh, people weren't allowed to shop. Like shop in stores. You know, there, there, were, there were signs and doors that would read, no dogs, no natives, for example. Wow. Um, wow. and this, so what were they supposed to do to, to buy goods, get somebody to shop are, for them or something? Are likely, uh, you know, there were some stores that would allow native people, you know, just like I think in, in probably similar to some of the history, um, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, again, in the continental United States, there were always some people within every society who understood the injustice and inequity in, in the situation that existed. I think a lot of people hearing this for the first time, maybe they don't know anything about Alaska universities, would just assume that there are administrators there who can understand the uh, issues uh, of the students actually at the university, which would be, it seems to be a no-brainer that you should be there, or somebody like you. So that wasn't the case. So no. w what was the pressure that brought you in or another well, indigenous administrator? I, I have to honor the legacy of indigenous leaders before me that really paved the way for Alaska Native people to have a place and a space within the institution at, at an administrative faculty and student level. And mm -hmm. so I'm certainly, I'm the second Alaska Native person to serve as, as a vice chancellor at the university. The first was the late Bernice Joseph, who um, passed away very young. And she was actually on my graduate committee. Mm -hmm. She was one of my first bosses when I moved out of the village as a teenager to the city. And so um, I had known her for a long time, but she was one of the champions of pushing her way into the system and saying, look, um, Alaska Native people should have a, a high place in the institution, be able to be a part of the decision makers who really determine how we move forward with our mission as an institution. And, um, and so I have to acknowledge some of those early forebears before me in, in, that, in that work. But what had happened is there, there was a you know, major civil rights movement. You know, I, I, couldn't, I put it into a 100 year plus context for Alaska people to work towards having a right to citizenship, right to vote, uh, having a right to own land in our own land. Um, right to uh, vote. Yeah. So when did that happen? What's the uh, similar to all the American Indian people, Native Americans in, in the continental U.S., the 1924 Indian mm -hmm. Citizenship Act also applied to Alaska Native people. Mm -hmm. So in 1924, um, but then we had the Jim Crow laws up there, just just like down here, where we're you know we're excluded from being able to vote. Actually, prior to 1924, there, in Southeast Alaska, where they had some of the longest contact with settler um, communities and people. Uh, they, they had to turn in a process to get citizenship and a vote for some native people, but they had to have something like, I should have researched this before this interview, but something like eight non-native people to declare that you are civilized and you had to give up your language, your identity, and you had to sign on a document saying you're no longer native mm -hmm. in, in order to be able to, to vote. Um, and very few people, of course, went through that process uh, prior to the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. But when, when, I, when I first came out of uh, Bashrenko, which is the village I come from, a very small village, we, like I said, I was living there with my grandfather and my uncle, single room cabin, no electricity, no running water. We were 200 miles from the nearest piece of cement. People, if you were ever to go there, wouldn't believe you were in the United States. And um, Gwich'in was the primary language being spoken. And uh, so I grew up in this really tight-knit community of 100 people, hundreds of miles from anywhere. You could walk 100 miles in any direction and just see the land. Maybe you'll run into 100,000 caribou migrating freely as they did you know, for thousands of years, and as they still do to this day, unobstructed by fences or industry or development. And so that's the land, the openness that I, that I came from. And when I, when I moved down into the city, we, we were, like most Native people, stuck in low-income housing because we didn't have, you know, uh, we were impoverished in that setting. And uh, I remember I was in junior high and they grabbed all the young Native men and they put us in a room one day and they said, look, you boys, odds are, statistically, that 
you're more likely to end up dead or in jail by the time you're 25 than you are to graduate high school. And sadly, those statistics um, largely stand true. And um, I myself was one of those statistics. Ended up being a high school dropout, didn't finish. And, and, uh, and you know, one, of, one of, I think it was about 12 or 13 of us in the room at that time, one took his own life within about a year. Um, I think maybe only one or two of us that were in that room finished high school. So the, you know, the, the legal system in Alaska is very much similar to here. We have very high numbers of Alaska Native people, especially Alaska Native men, um, who are incarcerated. Some completely unjustly incarcerated, many actually. Mm -hmm. We just had a major case called the Fairbanks Four, where we had four young men that are from my generation who spent something like 17 years in prison for a crime they did not do, and there was zero evidence in the courtroom to, and, and yet they were still convicted and they were, they were finally just recently exonerated by the, by the governor. Um, and so they're, they're free again. And these young men are incredible because they maintain a deep sense of spirituality and connection um, to their identity, to a cause. And um, they're, they're some of our most powerful advocates now for our young people. And, and, this, and their, their story is gonna go national here very soon with probably many documentaries and shows that are gonna come out. Uh, now, didn't you also do a feature film recently on uh, suicides of young people in Alaska? Yeah, so we, we just finished producing a film called We Breathe Again. It'll go uh, national on September 26th on um, PBS on a show called America Reframed, which is actually housed in the World Channel. Give us the title one more time. We Breathe Again. Okay, We Breathe and, Again. And, uh, and in that documentary, we, re we really wanted to follow the lives of uh, four Alaska Native people documenting the impacts of intergenerational trauma and suicide. Um, you know, we wanted to rate, um, show a lens into the experience of our people, ultimately for it to be a, a film that can add value and healing among our own people, but also, you know, we realize that our story is a human story. And it, and it has relevance for cultures and people around the world who are suffering from the impacts of, you know, hundreds of years of colonization that um, all of us have been impacted by in some way or another. And and so, you know, we're, we we really feel like the the stories that we we're able to capture um, over several years years of filming will will really um, shine a light on some important insights and stories. And so we're excited that the, the film was picked up and is gonna be. You know, uh, I'm, I'm so struck that uh, the kind of thing you're doing right this moment as we're talking, where you're, you're speaking very directly about things that have happened and uh, social conditions in Alaska and, and sort of the new Jim Crow issues up there, et cetera, uh, how little space there is in the culture for this kind of story to be told. You know, you, you'd think that given the magnitude of these problems, we'd be talking about this all the time. But what you're doing very effectively, I think right now, there's just precious little of. Uh, it just doesn't get out there very much. Well, you know, as, as Native American, Alaskan Native people, we're technically, statistically insignificant. So we'd never show up in the big national polls on, uh, you know, whether it's suicide rates, housing, electricity, running water, quality of life, um, uh, economic status and situations, and, and so, you know, we're, we're certainly among the most marginalized people in this country, and, and it's in our own home, which is, you know, the, the, the crazy piece of that ex experience that we have. Um, I want to jump back, though, to a mm -hmm. question we were tackling earlier um, around uh, what happened that made the university responsive, mm -hmm. to begin to become responsive. And, and I want to contextualize that in this, again, civil rights movement, essentially. And, it, it really uh, began you know, some hundred years ago. Our, our chiefs met uh, for the first time in 1915 with uh, a representative of the federal government and uh, declared their statement of interest in maintaining our way of life, living our life from on the land, um, having uh, access to jobs that were beginning to be created and access to education. And so even that long ago, they were aware of the importance of those things. Now, pushing forward from that 1915, a major piece of uh, legislation occurred in Alaska when we were still a territory, the territory of Alaska in 1945. There was a, a really substantial debate that was being championed by a woman named Elizabeth Prakovich, and it, it later became the Alaska Anti-Discrimination Act. And I think it was one of the first, if not the first, civil rights era 
pieces of legislation that mm. forced desegregation to occur, mm. forced the signs to come off the, the buildings of the no dogs, no natives, forced uh, the ability for our people to sit anywhere we wanted in movie theaters, you know, all these things. And, and that was back in, in, in 1945. And so, and then after that, that really pushed forward a groundswell. And of course, um, Martin Luther King down here, um, elevating the issues of civil rights among uh, other peoples of color really helped inspire a, a greater wave as well in Alaska. And so we had in the 1960s, uh, the Alaska Native leaders, a lot of them really young, basically publicly and in federal court saying, this is our land. We own it, we have a claim to it, and the US has to address it. And, and so really that pressure that was put forward by um, Alaska Native leaders in, in the 60s um, resulted, resulted in the passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971 where, well, whereby, depending on what lens you look at it, uh, we were stripped of most of our lands, but they, but they left 44 million acres w with us. And 44 million acres can sound like a lot unless you realize that there are 424 million acres mm -hmm. in, in Alaska yeah. of, of land. And so the vast majority of our land was taken. And I've heard some people say there really needs to be a comparative study between the Dawes Act and the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act as to how much land was actually stripped from indigenous people through. The what was the ownership of that land in kind of a, a, a award situation with the government where there were there was sort of federal oversight or was it truly the given to the people that, indigenous people that claimed it? The 44 million acres? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was really, and I don't wanna to get too technical yeah. into the, because this could be a whole other show, right. focusing just on the Native Claims Settlement Act, but the by that time, the federal government had a lot of experience with colonization and assimilation practices in Lower 48. And so they didn't want to go with a, a reservation system, even though there were already some reservations established in Alaska. Like my tribe, for example, we, we owned 1.8 million acres of land. We actually utilized the Indian Reorganization Act, which was extended to Alaska in 1936 to declare our land. And we, we were awarded uh, 1.8 million acres. Shortly thereafter, Congress quit awarding these uh, reservations in Alaska, because I think they realized that if they award all 229 tribes, 1.8 million acres, that's some 410 million acres. We'd own most of our own lands. And you know what colonizing country wants to enact legislation that allowed indigenous peoples to own their own lands? So, so, they, so there was only um, some five or so reservations established in Alaska before Congress quit approving those, those applications. Um, so when ANCSCA came along, they, they really undermined our tribal authority and they didn't gift, not gift, they didn't leave that the remaining land that they didn't take. Um, to our tribes uh, and 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 our um, well yeah to our tribes and our nations, they created for-profit corporations, and they gave those corporations the land, and they made our people become shareholders of the corporation. So they stuck us into a corporate structure with the intention of them reaping profit off of the land. That's what I was looking for. I and, was just and, assuming and, it's and, not wasn't so, going to be that simple. No, yeah. and and so really, um, you know, from a critical theory lens, uh, ANGSCA was a brilliant piece of assimilative legislation that put our people into a corporate model of hierarchy and exploitation. Yeah. And um, on the flip side, it did give our people, um, it forced a generation of people to become very savvy at running large institutions mm -hmm. at understanding the politics of economics mm -hmm. and economy and to leverage that power to affect change elsewhere within our state. And so that, that's why it's, yeah, it's a yeah. double-edged sword. Right. So, so we, we now are in a situation, or we began to be in a situation in the 70s, where we started to have all of a sudden some real political clout. We, we own land that was recognized by the federal government uh, through indigenous controlled institutions um, and, and tribes. And, uh, and by the way, on my reservation, we refused to participate in the Native Claims Settlement Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they extinguished our reservation status, and they moved our land into fee simple title. And so we, my tribe still owns our land, 1.8 million acres in fee simple status. Um, and I think we're one of the largest, if not the largest, private landholders in in the United States. Mm. And um, and so we we were able to retain our original tribal governance structure and ownership over our land. I mean a few other. Uh, tribes in Alaska were able to do that as well, but the the majority ended up being in this corporate system. Uh, I want to take you back for just a second to where we started with uh, your job as as vice chancellor at at the university. 
Uh, very few uh, indigenous administrators there. You know, you, you're not the first, but it's still, you know, new, new territory for this. Uh, couldn't have been a cakewalk. You know, it had to be difficult, uh, white bureaucracy. And then what you described earlier being with, um, being in terrible situations where, you know, you were being stripped of culture and so on, that just had to be soul crushing. What did you draw from? Uh, was, was there a role model? Was there a crystallizing experience? I mean, somehow you, you weren't crushed. You don't, you don't seem crushed. You're, you're an effective administrator. You're a powerful person in that bureaucracy. Where did that come from in you? Well, this goes back to my story of coming from the village to the city, mm. being a high school, high school dropout. Yeah. Getting caught up in um, drugs and alcohol, like many of the young um, Native men and other people of color that lived in the, the neighborhood that, that we pulls a that lot we, of people that under, we, that we but it came didn't from, move. and uh, and there was one day that uh, I had this major breakdown moment. I was pouring tears at a party, and uh, one of my cousins said, "What is going on? Like, where, why are you? You're having this major breakdown. You know, it was one of those deep crying where you're you barely can breathe. You're sobbing so hard, and uh, and." What came out of me was a lot of pain. And I realized that I was carrying a deep sense of pain, loss, and suffering. And I, I came to realize over that next six months from that moment that uh, there was substantial uh, disparities that existed in the world around us and that the experiences I had had and that our people were having um, were rooted in some kind of a historical context. and. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I, I also realized that I have an ability to change that situation for myself mm -hmm. and for my family is the way I thought initially. And I thought, you know, I don't want my kids to have to feel the pain and the experience that I've had to go through in this lifetime or that my, you know, I didn't really know at that time actually what, everything that my mother had been through. And so I, I told myself um, right about the time I was 16, turning 17, that, um, I made a commitment, a personal commitment that, that was, um, I know this is gonna be a hard journey, but I want to face the truth, go through whatever I have to go through to heal as a, as a person and work to change the situation that I was facing and I saw many of our people facing. And so that actually led me to go to college argue my way in. It took me about eight times. <laughs> it was finally, it was funny because it was, a, it was actually a Pacific Islander acceptance officer who brought me in and closed the door at one point in time, finally, and said, hey, look, he said, look, brother, he said, if you put as much work into college as you do, coming into here, arguing with us to let you in, I think you might be able to make it. And he said, so I'll tell you what, you take a practice ACT and score at least as at the level of our average freshman, and it's an open access enrollment university, so we let in a lot of people of different backgrounds, academic backgrounds, and, uh, and you promised me to get your GED in your first semester of college. He said, I'll give you a chance. I said, all right, let's do it. And um, so he, he gave me a chance. And um, ever since that day, which was quite a while ago now, um, over 24 years ago, I have been giving it my all to understand the, the history, the context, the experience that our people have gone through. And as I've discovered and learned about the experiences that our people have had to move through and are currently moving through, have found myself um, invited into positions like the one I'm in today to help affect institutional change and to address systemic issues that are um, really still to this day perpetuating a lot of the colonial mentalities and approaches to engaging with indigenous peoples. Um, you know, for for many of our people, it's like we have to deny some part of who we are in order to succeed in the Western academic system, and it should not have to be that way. And, and so that means that our institutions have to change. So I mean, the, the uh, high school graduation rate out of the school district from my, the village area that I come from is 41%. Hmm. The graduation rate, high school graduation rate for Alaska Natives across our state is 61%. And I don't believe it's because our people aren't intelligent and can't succeed in education. It's because the education system is failing our people. It is not reflective or relevant of our culture, our identity, who we are, our languages. And, and so we have a big job to do. 
in, in, in this in our generation, you know, and, and that's also in a lot of large piece of that work is at the post-secondary level. My, my guess is that you, I'm going to project something, you can tell me if this is correct, that you're probably a little bit sensitive on the issue of somebody saying, well, look at Vice Chancellor Peter, when you uh, lean forward, you know, you apply yourself, you know, you can make it. It's just really about dedication. And, you know, would it be a fair statement to say, you're a very strong person. And, uh, you know, probably any circumstance you were in, you were going to break through. But, uh, but generally, people need support. I mean, anybody does. They need resources and so on. So, you know, I, I'm, my, my guess is you're probably a little sensitive about being pointed to as, well, if people want to make it, you know, they can. Yes, you did, but generally, it, uh, creating bad circumstances for any community is not a good idea. Well, yeah. well, first of all, we all need help and support. We all need help and support. Yeah, no matter how strong someone appears on the outside, yeah. believe me, they're human on the inside. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's, there's no, no person who, you know, I don't stand in this position and do the work that I do alone. Yeah. I have my tribe, my nation, my family, you know, so many people. Um, just last night, actually, on social media, I reached out to everyone saying, hey, I, I need some support and encouragement because tomorrow's going to be a big day for me. And I want to honor our people, the legacy of our ancestors and our leaders. And, um, and that's what I, I you know, aspire to do in, in, in my lifetime. And so I, I think that you know, for many generations of our people, our people have had to do what we've had to do to continue to be here and retain our identity and who we are as indigenous people. And, and we've had some tough goes at it in the last five to 10 generations, depending on where you're from. And, and our, I think every generation's hope is that we break through a little bit further so the generation after us doesn't have to suffer quite as much. And, and, and so, you know, I, I think that even for our younger generation that's coming up today, they're, they're, they're facing some huge challenges. That, that's right. why we have this issue with high rates of suicide among our young people. They're, they're caught in a very complicated world that they're facing. And, a lot of the intergenerational traumas um, and impacts of colonization assimilation are still there. So, you know, so it, it you know, I think that uh, it's the work that we have to do. We're going to have to stop there. Thank you so much for being here today and telling us this uh, story. Maybe we can follow up sometime. I, I would love to do that. So yeah, thank, thank you, you for being thank here. Thank you for inviting me. That's all we have time for today. Please find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much for being a part of today's show. Join us next time for more current conversations.